Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rajiv and Dr. Agarwal and the team IDEC for inviting me here to talk on a very important topic, which uh, I'm sure we all talk about a lot, but do little about. Uh, I'm going to make it a very light and interesting and interactive talk, because I'm sure that through the morning we've had some great scientific talks on the gut and brain, as well as on hypoglycemia. So I thought I'll make a talk a little bit light, uh, so that you all can uh, enjoy and interact in this session. Right. So, mind-body connection. For those of you who are Bollywood fans, uh, and Professor Guillermo, uh, we all in India follow Bollywood and films very closely. Uh, so, I can uh, relate to this. Uh, you know, Tere Mere Beech Mein Kaisa Hai Ye Bandhan. If I were to translate it in English, what is this relation between you and me? Is I'm asking you all, what is the relation between the mind and body? So before that, we need to know, we know all about the body. But what is really the mind? Can anybody, we have a lot, lot number of students sitting here. Can anybody say, what is the mind? Where is the mind? We all sing a lot of songs on man. Mera man kyu tujhe chahe? But do we know where our mind is? Is it here? Is it here? Some people say, I think from my heart. Some people say, you know, I'm completely logical. So where is the mind? Is there something called the mind? Yes, there is. Thank God. <laughs> uh, then uh, where is it? Or what is mind? Is it equivalent to the brain? Yes? No? OK. We are not wrong there. So brain is the hardware of our mind. But mind is a very abstract concept. And to make it a simplistic, to give you a simplistic understanding of the mind, I'll describe it as a triangle. A triangle which is formed by your thoughts, by your emotions, and your behavior. And the sides of this triangle are connected with each other <clears throat> in bi-directional ways, which means the way you think affects the way you feel, in turn influencing your behavior. Similarly, the way you feel also influences your thoughts and in turn your actions. And your behavior also has an influence on your thoughts and emotions. I can give a very simple example right away here. Right now, while you're sitting here, some of you may be, folk, you know, feeling having the emotion of curiosity. Oh, this SMCW campus, you know, how beautiful this is. I'm coming here for the first time. I'm interested in knowing what is going on in the other Hall A. So there are parallel self-talks going on. And every emotion gives rise to an automatic thought conscious, unconsciously, right? Even without us being really aware of that. And that influences our behavior. So if my emotion is of curiosity thinking what is happening in Hall A, I am likely to be on my mobile chatting on WhatsApp. Oh, you know, my friend is in Hall A. I might just ask her what session is going on there, rather than focusing on what Dr. Girija is trying to say. Right? So this is what is going on constantly in our mind in order to, uh, uh, you know, influence our behavior every single moment. Now, this is again, uh, sorry, again, the slides are not, yeah. Uh, I'm sure uh, many of you are Madhuri Dikshit fans here, and this is a very popular song from the movie Tezab. So what I'm trying to depict here is the mind-body connection again, that even when you're falling in love, what do you experience? Dhak dhak karne laga. So your heart starts pounding really fast. Uh, so whether it's unpleasant emotion or whether it's pleasant emotions, Emotions are constantly communicating with your body to produce a response. Now, is it just external organs? No. It's communicating with all the body organs. It's communicating with entire system, entire physiological systems of our body each and every moment without our conscious awareness. Now, uh, as, as explained in the slide, it's not just about uh, physiological systems, but even your endocrine systems or your immune functions. Now, everybody in this today's world is talking about stress, right? So, what is stress? 
we all are saying, Are kya, you know, so much stress. Academics is stressful, traveling is stressful, family is stressful, husband is stressful, wife is stressful, relationships are stressful, financial finances are stressful. So what is exactly stress? Stress is nothing but a demand that is placed on ourselves, either from our external environment or from within ourselves, and it could be real or imagined. So it need not necessarily be something that is going on in our environment that causes us stress. But it could be our own expectations of ourselves. It could be our own thoughts, our own belief systems that could be giving rise to stress. So how we appraise a stressful situation determines our response to stress. And that's what differentiates between you stress and distress. So if my response to stress is adaptive, that is it allows me to utilize my resources to mitigate the stress, then that's what is called as a healthy level of stress or you stress. But if the, the stress, the response to stress is unhealthy by using unhealthy coping mechanisms or by, uh, you know, my irrational thinking patterns, then it's going to give rise to what we call as distress, uh, right? So this is just to give you a concept of distress and you stress. Now, how does mind and body interact? So when there is stress, what happens is the signal goes to your brain and it stimulates the corticotrophin releasing hormone, okay? And this hormone then acts on the anterior pituitary. So this hormone is released from your hypothalamus. It acts on your anterior pituitary to release the adrenocorticotrophic hormone, which then acts on your adrenal gland on the cortex to release a hormone, the stress hormone called as a cortisol. Now, in addition to this, there's another mechanism, there's another hormone that also gets released via the stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system, which is called as a norepinephrine. Now, this mechanism is a protective mechanism. So traditionally or ancestrally, whenever there used to be uh, any threat to human beings, this cortisol would be a protective hormone by whereby it would send blood supply, it would make our heart pump really fast so as to induce the fight or flight response. So it would help us to either move away from the threat or to protect ourselves, we would fight it, or if both is not possible, then it would actually go into a state of freezing. So fight, flight, or freeze. But as we have evolved, as human beings have evolved, the nature of stress has actually changed. Uh, what we now have are psychosocial stresses, right? So relationship stress, financial, academic, what I mentioned previously. But the evolutionary response still continues to be the same. So whenever there is any form of psychosocial stress too, our body does respond in the same way as it used to respond evolutionary-wise uh, in the olden days. However, we now have the thinking brain that too has developed, which allows us to make rational decisions, which allows us to problem solve, which allows us to plan, and, and that's called as the executive brain. Now the point I want to make here is that when we talk about chronic illnesses, it's like chronic stress. <clears throat> And I'll be talking about, you know, why is it a chronic stress. But simply to understand, when I spoke about stress and the reaction it causes in our body, usually when we mitigate the stress, the sympathetic nervous system will calm down, the cortisol levels will again calm down, because there is a negative, uh, there is a process in place uh, which sends a signal back to your brain to kind of uh, decrease the uh, production of ACTH and thereby regulating the cortisol in our body. But when we are constantly faced with chronic stress, and I think the pandemic is a perfect example of chronic stress, where there were so many situations, where there were so many things that were happening uh, with, within, uh, you know, for us in our environment to cause us constant stress. And when there is con chronic stress, then the cortisol levels continue to be high in our body and cause disastrous impacts, whether it inhibits our immune system, making us vulnerable to more infections, it causes, it interacts with our endocrine system, increasing blood sugar levels, or even interferes with our reproductive function, whether it's our, uh, you know, reproductive hormones and giving rise to problems like infertility or PCOD. So we see a myriad of bodily reactions uh, because of this one common factor, which is chronic stress, in, in which we are maladapting to, right? So, uh, okay, the slide has not changed here, right. So 
Why do I say chronic illness is equivalent to chronic stares? Because unlike an acute illness where we know that if we take certain medications it's going to come down and subside, in a chronic illness the tra it's usually not a curable illness, it's only treatable. That is with certain medications we can bring the illness under control. The course of that illness is usually very uncertain. We don't know, even in, in things like diabetes or in cancer, we don't exactly know how we are going to, uh, you know, what the prognosis is going to be or how it's going to evolve. The illness may require you to see multiple physicians, like in a, in a case of diabetes, we may need to see an ophthalmologist, we may need to see a podiatrist, we may need to see, you know, multiple physicians because we know that diabetes affects each and every organ and thereby the need for ongoing medical care and multiple investigations. It affects relationships. Uh, whenever you have a mem family member who is dealing with chronic illness, uh, it just doesn't add to the burden of the person who is suffering, but it also adds to the caregiver's burden and it can contribute to a lot of problems. Uh, it can cause financial stress. Medications are not, not inexpensive and doctors for sure are not. So definitely it causes a burden in terms of finance. And it even uh, for the person in terms of their own identity, uh, you know, what they can do and what, they, what ca they cannot do, there are a lot of restrictions that can be posed by an illness. So all these needs to be borne in mind when we are dealing with an uh, illness like uh, diabetes. So since this is a diabetes conference, I thought I'll focus on diabetes. There are numerous studies and I, I, I purposely thought I will not include literature here because I'm sure you all know that people with diabetes do have significant rates of diagnosed mental illness as against without. Uh, there is almost 20 to 25 percent of people who suffer from depression, nearly 40 percent suffer from anxiety and vice versa is also true. So just as I said, you know, mind influences body and body also influences the mind. So people with mental illness also there is a higher prevalence of diabetes. Okay, because of multiple reasons. It could also be because of the medications that they are on for their mental illness that can uh, increase their vulnerability to develop diabetes. And as I mentioned, the underlying bottom th line theory is that the chronic stress causes increased cortisol levels, which causes increased glucose in blood and decreased insulin receptor sensitivity. And also because of mental illness, uh, there could be a lot of lifestyle changes in a person with a person having low energy levels, thereby not exercising, thereby having poor dietary habits. Earlier in the day we saw how eating habits are also influenced by our mood and, and how that can become a very complicated uh, part in the management of diabetes. Now this is a very important concept to understand. It's not just about depression and anxiety. There is this, uh, as I mentioned, this distress which is experienced by majority of people at some point in time, right? Even in the pandemic, how many of you experienced some form of distress, psychological distress at some point? Yeah? Whether it was because of the lockdown, whether it was because of the inability to meet with your friends or relatives, we all experience distress. So what is exactly distress? How would I know whether I'm suffering from distress? There are certain physical symptoms, there are certain cognitive symptoms, there are certain mood symptoms or emotional symptoms which can help you to recognize whether you are in a state of distress. So if you're not getting good sleep, that can be an indicator. Say in a week's time, there are a couple of days when you're not able to fall asleep easily. If you're feeling, uh, if your appetite is going for a toss, either you're eating excessively or you're not having any appetite. If you're feeling really lethargic, if you're feeling tired, if you don't have the energy to do things, uh, if you, uh, your mood fluctuations are happening too frequently, where you know, either you're feeling too happy or too sad, or you're feeling anxious without any good reason, or you're feeling sad without any good reason. You're not able to focus, you're not able to concentrate. You're having multiple aches and pains which are not explainable by any physician. You're having headaches that don't really have any cause. You're having GI upsets or you're having problems like acidity then most likely it is distress, psychological distress that it is contributing to. So, and, and this is not really causing any interference in your day-to-day -day functioning. So it has not reached the mental illness stage yet, but it is just at that distress stage, and which is why it, it is very important as a physician to know the concept of distress. So as you can see in the slide, there are multiple reasons why individuals with diabetes could be experiencing distress because there are so many things that they need to uh, adjust to in life. They have to titrate the dosing of the medications, diet control, exercise, 
you know, there are so many suggestions given by relatives. Doctors are constantly giving them, ye karna hai, wo nahi karna hai. They have to monitor their blood glucose. They have to monitor their eating pattern. You know, whenever they go out for a wedding too, they have to consciously think about what they're eating, how their sugars are going to impact. We just had a session on hypoglycemia, and the fear of even having hypoglycemia is, is very significant. So in, essentially, you have to, uh, you know, pe people with diabetes are constantly juggling with these kind of issues in their mind. So uh, if you talk to patients who are experiencing diabetes, uh, the common emotions that they go through are, initially there's a stage of denial, then, you know, there is fear, there is uh, anger, uh, there is also, uh, and, and finally they, they even end up feeling quite low and sad. Uh, there are various other emotions which are aroused by different things that are happening with them, like they feel that their life is entirely being controlled by their diabetes that they're having. The perceived lack of support, the fear of failure, of keeping up with the diabetic care, ultimately leading to a feeling of burnout. Burnout is when you don't have the energy and motivation to really look after yourself. That's when you en enter into a stage of exhaustion or burnout. And that ultimately leads to really, you know, having this burden of living with a chronic illness, feeling really socially isolated, having a poor quality of life. Now, this is a, uh, this is a survey tool that can be very easily used in any clinician setting. It's called as a problem areas in diabetes survey. I think there's also another survey. I was just reading through the literature and I found Rajiv sir's paper in which he, is, he talks about uh, a diabetes distress uh, questionnaire. Uh, it's a 18 or 19 uh, point uh, survey tool which helps you to identify what are the problem areas, where are the problem areas that a patient, is, patient of diabetes is struggling with. And this, this one is a 20 point, uh, 20 item, 6 point Likert scale. Uh, where, uh, you know, uh, it really helps you to understand which are the various areas in which a person is struggling. Now, I, uh, we are focusing on patients, but what about the clinicians? We also need to look after the mental health of clinicians who are treating patients with diabetes or patients with chronic illness. Because remember, a doctor is also a human being at the end of the day. And, you know, uh, when does a doctor feel at utmost peace and satisfied? when a patient is showing good results, when the patient is compliant with treatment, and uh, you know the patient is doing exactly what the doctor is telling. That's the doctor-patient relationship that is the most ideal and which is most sought after. But unfortunately, in people with chronic illness, the doctors have to constantly struggle because they're dealing with an illness which is long-term, which we don't know how the prognosis is going to be. So they have to constantly maintain the patient's hope. Patients are constantly coming in saying, I have an adverse effect, this medicine is causing me side effect. All this is impacting, remember, even the clinician's mental health. What about the compliance issues? When, when the doctor feels frustrated that despite telling the patient so many times about taking the medications on time, the patient is refusing to do so. And when the patient brings in the psychosocial aspects, telling them that, you know, I have no family members to look after or I have a financial problem, all this creates a lot of uh, emotion, emotional turmoil even in clinicians. So when we talk about mind-body connection, it's important even to look after the clinician health. And, and how can the health professionals do so? In a busy OPD, what, what are some of the things that as a clinician I can do to not only look after my mental health, but also my patient's mental health? Having an est establishing a good rapport. Now, that doesn't mean I need to have really talk about his personal history or need to know what is going on in the family. A good rapport may just involve making eye contact, making sure I address the patient with his first name. Uh, you know, establishing that connect with the patient when you're talking with the patient. Or, uh, you know, uh, just, just uh, you know, appreciating something that you notice in the patient can also help you to, you know, have a good rapport uh, with your patient. Uh, making sure you have a team to support you. It's not a one-person job, management of diabetes. So involving a psychologist, maybe a health psychologist in your team. We do involve, we often tend to forget this very important aspect of involving a mental health professional in multidisciplinary teams. I'm sorry to say, but psychiatrists are one of the most stigmatized branches even in the field of medicine. And even a referral to psychiatrist often is a very last resort only when a patient becomes severely mentally ill. I think that stigma from healthcare professionals should really, really come down. Because as I said, mind and body are completely inseparable and mind somewhere has a higher control over your body than your body itself. 
making, uh, you know, support groups play a very important role in management of patients. Uh, you have support groups for cancer, you have support groups for schizophrenia, you have support groups for many of the chronic illnesses. It's, uh, I don't know whether there are support groups for diabetes, but it would really be helpful if there are support groups for diabetic patients too. Because what patients can contribute, and uh, you know, just by talking about their experiences with their illness and their journeys, can actually become a great support system and take the burden of clinicians to do so. And finally, stress management, not just for patients, but for doctors too. It's high time that doctors look after their own health uh, when they're especially dealing with patients who are uh, suffering from chronic illness. Uh, I will not go into stress management for lack of time, but it essentially means, uh, you know, maybe even problem solving, time management skills, some relaxation techniques, uh, working on your own thoughts, uh, you know, through cognitive behavior therapies, one of the most commonly used therapies in our practice, which really helps us to change our maladaptive thinking to, uh, you know, to challenge our irrational beliefs to make them more rational. Now, to especially deal with uh, illnesses like diabetes or chronic illnesses, mind-body therapies become very, very useful. And, and there's, there's enough scientific evidence uh, to show that they're quite effective in the management of patients, so much so that actually medication doses can be reduced if uh, we are applying these therapies in practice. So what, what is the basis of these mind-body therapies? They really focus uh, on helping us become more conscious of our mental state and to in using this increased awareness, if we can actually guide our minds in the direction we want, it to, uh, want to drive it. Right, so what is mindfulness? Mindfulness is nothing but bringing our awareness to the present moment without actually judging it and accepting, accepting it, right? So whether it's bringing our awareness to our thoughts, emotions, feelings, whether it's bringing our awareness to our bodily sensations, Whatever you choose to bring your attention to, you're bringing your awareness to without judging it. That's very important. We often tend to be very judgmental. That's, again, a, a thing that we learn through our growing up years, that we are constantly saying, using adjectives, oh, this is not good, that is bad, this is right, that is wrong. Who are, I mean, I, I personally feel, you know, we should not be, uh, who are we to decide what is right and wrong? It's a very subjective thing. So it's very important that, uh, you know, mindfulness plays a very important role. Dr. Gita, so there are various, can you sum up, please? Yes. Mindfulness-based therapies. Meditation is nothing but a part of mindfulness-based therapy. Yoga, as we all know, it, it is bringing the awareness to various body postures and also to your breathing. And, of course, a slow breathing exercise. So essentially, to conclude, chronic illness involves more than physical symptoms, and it definitely includes psychological and emotional symptoms, which can be profound. It can disrupt our social life and put strains on our social support networks. People with chronic illness are more likely to be depressed and suffer from mental health issues. And emotional disturb disturbance can interfere with compliance to treatment and worsen prognosis. Uh, we, paucity of time, I would have loved to conduct a mindfulness activity, but I'm sorry. Uh, uh, and ultimately, I'll conclude by saying that your mind, emotions, and body are instruments, and the way you align and tune them determines how, you, how well you play the game of life. Thank you so much.